Hi, this is Natalie with Vitiligo Friends Podcast. I'm very excited about our show today. We're going to be speaking with Lachlan Hay, Head of Global Network and Communications at Clenuvel, about Sines, a new vitiligo treatment. Hi, Lachlan. Welcome to Vitiligo Friends Podcast, and thanks so much for making time to uh, talk with us today. Thank you, Natalie. Thanks for having me on. Um, could you please give us a little background about Clenuvel? Of course. Clinivell is a biopharmaceutical company. We have operations in Europe, the US, and in Australia. Across the three domains in which we work, we employ 27 staff. The company has been running for around about a decade, and over the last five years, we've focused specifically on the development of a product called Senes. We also have a second product in development, which is called CUV9900. And both of these are drugs in development. These are both what are called melanocortin drugs. And this is a new class of drug which interacts with melanocortin receptors in the body. It's not important to understand at the moment, but we'll talk about it a little bit more later. Okay. In brief, SNES as a product targets the skin to activate melanin in the skin. And right. when I say melanin, I mean pigment and color. So as a company, we are working particularly on this one product, and we are taking that product to market, and that's a, a very distinct process that you go through as a company. And so tell us exactly um, what does Sines do for vitiligo? Okay, let's talk a little bit about Sines itself first. Sines is an injectable drug which is designed to mimic the skin's natural defensive response to UV and light. It's really under important to understand what I mean by mimic. When you or I, Natalie, go outside and we expose our skin to certain wavelengths of light, and here I'm talking specifically about ultraviolet light between 290 and 400 nanometers, a series of reactions occur with our skin cells. Now, some of these reactions can lead to damage, for example, wrinkles and, and what's called photoaging, mm -hmm. as well as skin cancer, and others mount a protective response, which try to repair, and, uh, repair the damage that's caused and also protect the body from further UV impact. Okay. Now, this is a fairly complex series of reactions, but there are a number of enzymes and hormones which are involved, and one of them is called alpha melanocyte stimulating hormone, or alpha MSH. Alpha MSH is produced by a particular type of skin cell called a keratinocyte. It then travels to another type of skin cell called a melanocyte, where it activates melanin. Now, this is something that we know as the tanning response, but it's actually a protective response. Oh. Melanin, as a, as a molecule, absorbs light. It also reflects light and refracts light. So it protects our skin from certain wavelengths of light. Right. So what we know is that alpha MSH is an easy hormone to replicate in the lab. It consists of 13 amino acids, which think of them in terms of a building block yeah, as to how you build a molecule. In the 1980s, a group of U.S. scientists looked at this process, looked at the, the tanning response, and then tried to determine whether they could administer a man-made version of alpha MSH to replicate that response, to protect the skin. And so they looked at how is it that we could administer a drug, a pharmacological response, that would protect the skin using our own system. So that's why we talk about mimicry. That's really, really important to understand that you're using the body's own mechanisms with this drug. Okay. So the US team took a, a number of, of alpha MSH analogs, so they changed the, the makeup, they changed those building blocks of alpha MSH to try and determine whether these had a, an effect or a potential to become a drug. And when I talk about this, they're not looking at one, two, or three. They're looking at hundreds, potentially thousands of different analogs. Now, one of these was found to have a greater effect in activating melanin, and it also had a longer half-life, which is important because it meant it could be administered as a drug. This is aphomelanotide, which is the basic technology that underpins SNES. So that comes full circle in terms of the history of the drug and, and how it came about. And it's important to understand that all of this is, is based around that concept of mimicry. Okay, so initially the work then was um, promoted to find, I guess, a way to protect everyone's skin against skin cancer, and then it evolved into being able to potentially use it to repigment 
in vitiligo patients? Right. Right. Okay. Originally, the, the actual funding for the, the first program with this drug in humans was funded by the NHS, uh, sorry, the NIH in the US, and it was funded as a melanoma prevention strategy. Okay, that's fantastic. That's a, a neat turn of events. Or it's very interesting how one um, medicine can then be used uh, for different diseases as well. Right, right. Um, all right. Well, the, the exciting news is that you guys have uh, come upon the ability to um, trial this uh, with the FDA here to be approved uh, for administration uh, to be administered um, to patients in the United States and uh, I guess all over the world after that. Is that okay. correct? Well, it's uh, there are a lot of steps that we need to take as a company. Okay. So. Let's, let's talk about vitiligo, and I think it's important that people understand what we're trying to do with this drug. Okay, great. Because vitiligo, the, the actual cause of vitiligo is unknown, mm -hmm. it's very difficult. As you know, as you've spoken about with, with lots and lots of people on your show and on your blog, it's very difficult to understand how these treatment processes work. Right. That said, there are some treatments that we know have an effect in some patients. And I know you've spoken before about narrowband UVB and about UVB treatments. That's, mm -hmm. that's something you've been through yourself, right? Well, ab absolutely. And it did work temporarily, but it did work. So that was the, the, okay. the thing I took away from that was that um, vitiligo, at least in my case, I know there's lots of different types, but at least in my case, it wasn't a permanent thing. It was just uh, something was missing to turn on and off the gene that was allowing my skin to pigment. And okay. so um, I walked away with at least that being good news. It wasn't something permanent. Okay. The way that narrowband UVB works, well, it really works in two different steps. So the way that, uh, that we understand it is that the first thing that, that narrowband UVB does is to activate stem cells within your own body. So if you look at a cross-section of how skin is built, You'll notice that midway down in the hair follicle, where your hair actually sits within the skin, there is a little reserve of stem cells. Think of these like a, like a blank tape almost. And what narrowband UVB can do is activate these stem cells within the hair follicle and encourage them to mature, so to put something on the tape. And what it does is it, it activates them to mature into a melanocyte. Okay. So those, those skin cells which activate pigment. This takes time. This is not a quick process, and that's why there is this ongoing need with narrowband UVB two, three times a week to, to go to the clinic and, and have the treatment. Mm -hmm. So that's the first step is that we see, we see stem cells within the hair follicle being activated. They then migrate up into the skin, and it is, it's a literal migration process. They do physically move. Mm -hmm. And the second step is, like I explained before with it, alpha melanocyte stimulating hormone or alpha MSH, the keratinocytes within your skin start as a response to UVB, start producing alpha MSH, which then travels down to the melanocyte and you start to see pigment again. Okay. Okay. So the process with narrowband UVB is this two-step process. That's why you start with narrowband UVB treatment. You start seeing little islands of pigment within a lesion. Right, and then they grow together. I get it. Okay. Right, right. So because there's alpha MSH involved, our team looked at this process and said, if we administer our drug, which is a way of, of mimicking alpha MSH or mimics that, that process within the system, uses the body's own machinery, can we help to repigment skin in vitiligo? So what we're going to try and do in our, or what we will be doing in our trial program is taking a number of patients in a pilot trial, so this is a small trial, and administering our drug to half of them alongside narrowband UVB treatment, and the other half of the patients involved in the study will just receive narrowband UVB treatment. And what we'll do is we will evaluate whether or not our drug has an effect in vitiligo, either in speeding up the narrowband UVB treatment, so will start seeing repigmentation faster or whether it will require fewer narrowband UVB treatments 
in order to start seeing that that repigmentation process. Okay. So essentially what we're trying to do is, is whether to determine whether or not our drug can assist in repigmentation alongside the other Sorry, one second. I know we can you hear that interruption? Sorry about that. You're okay. Um, all right, so the FDA trials is going to figure out if your um, if the SNES will shorten the time for the pigmentation to um, occur with UVB treatments. Yeah, we are, we are using this as an adjunct treatment or okay. as a combination therapy. And then what about the longevity? Um, like when I did my UVB treatments, um, I did it on my hands, my uh, some places on my face, my elbows, and my knees. Those are the only places that I, I really have the vitiligo. And um, I haven't had any new places, so I'm just going to talk about those spots. My elbows... Um, Repigmented fairly quickly, and and it has stayed. Uh, most of it stayed. It didn't fade. My hands, however, um, they were slow to repigment, and what did repigment has faded for the most part. My knees completely filled in, and they are still completely filled in. And my face is the same as my hands. What was um, white patches before are back again. So um, I'm, I'm guess I'm wondering what if you guys have done any trials then as well about the longevity of it. Of course, in terms of long-term use of the drug, uh, we've certainly done a lot of treatment. But in terms of long-term repigmentation in vitiligo, this will be the first time we're ever going to trial the drug in individuals with vitiligo. So we don't know as okay. of yet. Okay. Uh, as part of this study, we are going to do a six-month follow-up. So once each of the patients has completed the trials, and it's a, a six-month treatment process, once each of the patients has, has completed that, we'll then follow them up a couple of times over the next six months to determine whether or not we still see that same level of, of repigmentation because, of course, and, and I think a lot of your listeners will be in a, a similar situation where they might have undergone any vitiligo treatment and then have seen regression back again. Well, all right, great, Lachlan. So if someone wanted to participate in the trials, what would be the process to apply and what would they need to do? The first thing that anybody should do whenever they're considering any kind of new trial is to speak to the current doctor. And that's mm -hmm. what we try and tell everybody before they come to us, before they start hunting down a, a treatment centre, is go and speak to your doctor first because they know your treatment better than anybody else. Now, to help you in that conversation, we've tried to put together a little bit of information on how an individual can get involved in a particular study. I'm not going to cover it all here, but we can put some more information towards our website at the end of the program. Absolutely, and I'll put it on mine as well. Fantastic, fantastic. But there are a couple of things that, that I do want to get across to people. Firstly, don't contact us. Um, as a company, we, we need to, to keep a little bit of distance between the people who are involved in our studies and, and the company ourselves because we need to ensure that, that uh, everything in the way that we run that trial is done according to the regulations that exist. So speak to your doctor first. Absolutely. The next thing is we have a couple of, of strict inclusion and exclusion criteria. Now, these are something that we have for every study. There are a large number of, of inclusion and exclusion criteria. Again, you can find these on the website. But some of the key ones for this vitiligo study is you can't have had vitiligo for more than five years. And okay. You can't have vitiligo which covers uh, any less than 15% of your body and any more than 50%, 50%. Now, there are a couple of reasons for this. I don't want to go into them in, in too much depth, but essentially we need to make sure that the people who are involved in our study have a similar level of vitiligo and we can compare the outcomes from that treatment. Just about trial inclusion is that we do have a, a strict exclusion criteria for individuals who are currently undergoing treatment. 
Now, the reason for that is that we want to make sure that no prior treatment affects the outcome of the study. Mm -hmm. So we need to make, uh, make sure that the people who are involved are what we call treatment naive. Okay, that that's, makes sense. On the uh, trials, when we were talking about earlier um, with people who have undergone UVB treatments that going um, three times a week versus th uh, two times a week made a big difference, what, if you have determined that, what will be the um, amount of times that in the testing that you will do? Is it going to be two times a week, three times a week? It's three times a week. It'll be three times a week. That, I ask that because for those of us who cannot participate in the trials, that is a good gauge uh, as well because it worked for me. It made a huge difference. Um, when you are going and, and paying for UVB treatments, to make sure that you are doing it frequently enough to make a difference. And so I wanted to see what the professional uh, view is that on that. Um, I think we have time for a couple of questions if, if you are able to. Of course. All right. I'm from Kelly Ryman in North Haven, Connecticut. She'd like to say that she believes there were preliminary trials that had already been done and how successful were the trials? Okay, this is the first trial that we're running for vitiligo. Okay. But uh, it's correct in that we have run other trials of the drug before. In fact, we've been running trials of the drug for more than 10 years. Uh, we've trialed this drug in more than 550 people to date uh, over an extended period of time for, for some of those individuals, so we have seen ongoing dosing. But none of them have vitiligo. Most of them have uh, diseases which are light sensitivities. Uh, some of them are organ transplant patients who have a higher susceptibility to skin cancer. But to date, we haven't trialed in anybody with vitiligo. Okay. And her next uh, portion of the question is, if this upcoming trial is successful, how long would it be before uh, the treatment option would be made accessible to everyone with vitiligo? That's a great question, and it's a very difficult one for us to answer. I appreciate it's probably the most important question for, for people with Yeah. Life. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's difficult because at the moment we don't know any trial results. So until we actually have some, some results in hand, some data in hand of evaluating how the drug works, and importantly, it's, it's really important that people understand this, that we also want to make sure that the drug is safe. Now, we have no reason at the moment based on, on the trials that we've done with other people to think that the drug is unsafe, but the regulators require that we make sure the drug is safe in every patient population that we trial the drug in. Mm -hmm. So until we have that data on whether the drug works and whether the drug is safe, we're not going to be able to predict what the next steps in a clinical trial program are. That said, to shed a little bit of light for you, this is a pilot phase two study that we're conducting. Pilot phase That's two, okay. A pilot phase two. As a company, to get a drug to market, we have to run further studies. So there will be further studies that will be required in order to get the data that is asked of us by regulators like FDA in order to get this drug to market. So... Even though we will go through this process with this pilot study, there will be further research that needs to be done. All right. Well, and for those of us who are very unfamiliar with the phases of studies, you say pilot phase two. How many are there, just so we can gauge a little bit of time? A phase two is where you first trial a drug in a specific condition. So. Okay. A phase one, which we've done multiple phase ones, is where you give the drug to what you call a healthy cohort of patients to determine how the drug works in the body on a quote-unquote healthy person. A phase two is where you then apply what you've learned in phase one and, and the science and the scientific grounding that you have. You then apply that in a particular condition. And essentially, it's a proof of concept. Does the, the scientific basis that you have for using this drug in the clinic actually work? Are you starting to see data? Mm -hmm. That's normally done with a small patient population. It's normally done in, in, in a few centers um, and often will only be done in one or two countries. The next step is to then go through to a phase three study 
these are normally much, much larger studies, and these can involve hundreds, if not thousands, of patients over several years, depending on the condition that you're studying, and will often be run across a large number of countries. To give you an idea, when we ran a phase three study, or our first phase three study that we completed in a rare disease called erythropoietic protoporphyria, where you only have 10,000 patients approximately worldwide, we ran that in 11 centres across Europe and Australia. Oh, okay. So you're starting to get an idea of the scale of study that, that you would need to run in phase three. Mm -hmm. um, now, in terms of, of what are the steps for, for Clibel with SNES in vitiligo, we don't know until we finish this first pilot study and have results in hand. Okay. And then we start discussions with regulators as to where we go from here. Okay. Well, you know, some people may um, wish that there was a, a simple answer to that, but the good news is is that there's trials being done. You know, <laughs> you know, right. you're, you're you're working on it, so that's fantastic. Could you please give us the um, the website address so that um, anyone who is interested to get more information about SNES and read more about the uh, upcoming trials? They can visit your site and then find out what, more about it. Of course. It's www.clinuvel, which is C-L-I-N-U-V-E-L, dot com forward slash vitiligo. Clinuvel dot com forward slash vitiligo. Great. We're going to post all of our information. You can find more information on the trial that we're conducting, on how you get involved. You can also view a few videos that we've made thus far just talking about vitiligo and also how we expect our treatment to work. And, you know, the videos that you have made, Lachlan, or that the company has made, is, in my opinion, so very impressive. Um, to me, it shows such a level of caring about uh, the suffering of people that have vitiligo. You know, it shows real involvement um, a, a, to educate and to um, make them feel that you are a part of their world because, um, you know, it does, when you have vitiligo, you can, or any disease, I, I would imagine, you can feel oh, I've that... i lost you there, Natalie. Sorry, I lost you there. Oh, okay. I was just saying that it was wonderful that you guys have those videos, and they are so well made and very informative that um, everybody should really go out and check those uh, to learn more about how the vitiligo process in our skin. It was just amazing to see that. I had read a lot about it, but to see it in action on your videos was just great. So thank you. Thank you, Nelly. We really appreciate that, and and. The company is planning to release more videos focusing on vitiligo fairly soon. So oh, you can keep Great. an eye out for those too. Yeah, we will. All right, thanks. Thank you so much, Lachlan, for taking the time um, to talk with me. And uh, we look forward to the results. Thanks, Natalie. Thanks for joining me today. If you'd like to learn more about vitiligo, you can visit my website at vitiligocover.com. Um, if you'd like to meet other people that have vitiligo, I set up a Facebook page, and you can go to Facebook.com, Vitiligo Friends. If you'd like to reach me on Twitter, I'm at Natalie P, N-A-T-H-A-L-I-E-P. And I'm also um, on Twitter as at Vitiligo Corner. I'd like to thank our sponsor, Vitiligo Cover Lotion, and we'll talk to you next week. Have a great week. Bye.